You gotta fucking stop. You gotta stop with all this I can't catch a break bullshit. All the time you're complaining, you could be instead hustling. You could be instead chasing your dream. You could be instead figuring out what you're doing wrong, trying to improve certain aspects of your life, getting your shit together, reading a book, meditating, something. Fucking something. But this I can't catch a break shit is not helping anybody, and it pushes everybody away from you. I think then um, anybody I can put a name to to promote our sport. The archer who owns all the world records, John Demmer III. You know, the more difficult a thing is, the more important the mental game becomes. I, I didn't eat any supper yet either. How about you guys? Do you guys eat yet? I didn't eat Oh, that. you know, uh, I have some crunch berries. Oh, yeah. Um, Grayson Parlo. It's like me taking three or four years off your eyes just because I weakened that prescription in the shooting eye. And don't put everything into my shot that I should that I get a lot of drop on those heavy arrows and just dropping all the way down. He said, well, you might want to think about going to a light. Or that the person that is joining is actually the person that's joining. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the has been. <laughs> that's funny. Dude, I just stepped on a nail. I had to check my foot like six times to make sure I wasn't bleeding. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> <laughs> so it what took is, me a little a couple minutes what is the chances hold on a second i got a couple people uh what is your question question and are you coming on live feed so i i was telling people like you know the the goal here is first of all we're, you and i are just gonna chat but I got probably like three or four people already that want to come on a live feed, ask a question, a, you know, a bare bell related question. Hopefully everybody keeps it PG 13. Um, and you know, we'll just, you know, we'll just get to shoot from the hip and try to help some people out, John. All right. Sounds good. Hey, can we give a, a shout out to Maggie? Just smoke the indoor round today. Yes, yeah, she did. Uh, Maggie, broke her own world record again i think this is probably I, i'm gonna go out on a limb and say around the 10th or 11th time she's broken a world record <clears throat> um in totality same record she already had um shot a 526 indoor round she is shooting very 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 well i think it was 526 ballpark 528 something like that um she is um on the precipice really of like shooting really damn good. <laughs> Absolutely. But she's putting in the work. I yeah. mean, you know, and she's also definitely reached a level of, she's no longer, a, you know, the kid that shoots real good. She's a, she's a veteran shooter for the most part. Now she understands her equipment more than she ever has. She knows what she has to do to get ready. I mean, it's perfect timing for her to go away to college because, um, it's um yeah it's going to be an exciting thing to watch how bear bow really starts to pick up in the college ranks for sure so I'm excited about that how are you doing man still still looking good i saw it. we shot together on uh friday and you know you still keeping just keeping down i know you're working out some now and stuff yeah i weighed in this morning at just under uh 177 so nice. there's probably a slight dehydration there but uh I'll take it <laughs> awesome yeah i know i know you uh you just kind of started shooting again same here well, i guess we're both kind of you're definitely ahead of me by about two weeks i was still dealing with that stupid shoulder issue but i feel better now we got to shoot up at lonesome road that was fun we had a good time yeah. how about morgan nyer yeah yeah so she did good morgan's been shooting archery barebow for mm, maybe a year at this point and her little sister nola shoots everybody's familiar with her she has a couple national records uh her dad's michael nyer he's a our our assistant coach for gha he's a, a bare bow uh shooter and morgan's a senior and um just started shooting like i said a year ago she shot a 488 indoor round first I, that might have been her first or second 60 arrow scored this year. So she's it in is. a really good place. 
She shot a pretty good first half. Yeah. You watch her. She she is a she's a very comfortable, repeatable shot. Like she's she she's doing a lot of good things right now. So I'm excited to see how how things work for her. She's planning to go shoot archery in college as well. Well, I'm not. I don't. I know things, but I don't. I'm not putting out there. So, um, but we can say I'll give a, another shout out to Maggie though. Maggie's going to shoot at University of Pikeville. Congratulations to her. Big scholarship there. Awesome opportunity. People, barebow shooters are getting scholarships to shoot in archery, archery in college. It's a big deal. That's a big deal. So, how's the Formula XD working for you, my man? Uh, so far, so good. Um, I got some more arrows coming. I'm hoping by Tuesday so I can start testing out some really long six and seven hundred spine. Um, the one thing that I, I it was nice about getting on the line again is the first time I got on the line and same and shot under a clock since what we shot target nationals it's, mm-hmm. it's been a it's been a long time felt good uh learned a couple things um it's always nice to to shoot a small event like that just to get the tournament stress you know back underway you know learn what you need to change on your equipment and what's going to work what's not going to work um mm-hmm. so yeah I played with the uh the tune a little bit more uh, last night did okay you did um uh same yeah. arrows the the same yep same arrows same point weight um i keep forgetting to throw that stupid bear shaft in the in the quiver <laughs> so From i can the really match the match grade 6.5 yeah. yeah so we're all playing with some arrows right now i'm still shooting the rx7 23 12s um temporarily uh, I did shoot the XDs, the micro XDs, but the spine I got is just too light. The other spine I have, it's, it's just they're cut short for 50 meters. And my crawl is stupid big, and I can't stand shooting a large crawl for indoors. So right Jake now, does. Well, Jake doesn't shoot indoor archery with bear balls. <laughs> At least yeah, I he does. It's on the videos. Yeah, it's on the videos. That's right. That's right. Um yeah, we'll avoid that topic. Um, but anyways, no thanks. No big crawls for me. No big crawls for me or anyone I work with, if if I have a say. But those the, those arrows, I shot your those match. Oh, I shot the white ones. Did I shoot the white ones? I don't know. You shot the white outs, yeah. Yeah, the white outs. That's not that it matched. They flew good, but 500 spine, 200 and what? 250 grains up front? Yep. 250 yep yeah one, 175 green points and 75 green inserts yeah so they're you know they're the pro the only the only downfall of those arrows is they're just they're 31 inch yeah they're right. yeah 30 they might even be 30 and a half yeah they they man if they had that that arrow and a 600 700 spine we talked about this friday a 600 700 spine um at like 33 inches that would be an amazing arrow shaft for indoor archery. Yeah, I can and get three. away with. Yeah, I can get away with the uh, thirty-two inch six hundred. But yeah. Uh, yeah, we need those lighter spines, man. Let's go. Well, I, was, I, I can't I was, even bust on Steve Anderson anymore because he's he's working for. <laughs> I was talking to somebody last night, um, and you know they were you know asking me about things, and and they're shooting uh, the what the R rx what are the ones you shooting the rx7 the black rx7 yeah two-tone one yeah yeah shooting that and shooting like the the 500 spine or 475 or five and a quarter whatever that spine is and shooting 30 pounds i'm like oh hello contact city mm. i don't know i like we'll yeah i mean i like the way those 23 12s shoot they fly great but i mean the I, i'm still I don't want, I honestly don't want to shoot those arrows because the forgiveness isn't there for me. I think if you have a super, super, super consistent shot and you're well practiced and everything's going well, that arrow's going to work great for you or 23 carbon. But like, I'm not there yet. And, but I'm still shooting because that's what I have. And I have like three dozen of them. Yeah. I'm going to shoot them anyway. You know, I'll, I'll beat the crap out of them. I'm not, you know, it is what it is. But, yeah, we'll see. We'll see I how it out, goes. I pulled out my uh, fat boys last night too to mm-hmm. mess around with at the at the range. I knew that. Um, those good. are those are like almost thirty three inches long. 
Yeah, same 500 spine. Uh, and they were pretty wicked weak with the 175 grain points. <laughs> um, but I didn't have my 150s on me, so I didn't shoot them. <laughs> but I was I was still shooting like that 40 to 41 pound range. Mm -hmm. um, backed it down to like 39 and, and uh, they flew better, but I just didn't have enough time and just wanted to get some reps in. So, and you didn't, you didn't so you didn't score with those. I didn't score with anything last night, just getting reps in, working on back, working on follow through, trying to fine tune that thing because that's pretty sloppy right now. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Well, I guess what do you think like so at this point in in your season what are like what's your focus yeah you we see a lot of people shooting good big scores right now but in tournaments there's not a lot of tournaments going on so like so let's talk about like robbie just shot iowa pro-am he shot really well there um yeah he did really good today like yeah. uh like a raw score of like 280 half or something today yeah good. we were texting i think lancaster would have been like a 280 two or yeah 283 uh, i think yeah. yeah um and he's you know so like robbie's in a good place matt yak is shooting quite a bit there's others that are out there and they're practicing so what what are your what's your weekly shooting schedule and i know yours varies with work and fishing and stuff like that um what's what's your weekly shooting schedule like i'm i'm like three days a week max so that's about all i can get in what, uh, what well, I got I got lucky they opened that range up like literally uh on my way to and from work. Like the driveway is like a quarter mile and it's a quarter mile off the exit that I drive by every day. So it's it's like li uh, literally an a mile out of my way round trip. So for me it's it's way super convenient now for the first time in like forever. So my practice is definitely uh more available now. So I'm trying, I'm trying to get on like four to five days if I can. Some of them will be short sessions. Some of them will be a little longer, but I, I've already moved on my phase. Like I already got, I slammed out like two weeks of hard shooting um, to work on getting the strength back. Um, so my strength is pretty decent now. And so like I can finally move on to like tuning the arrows and, and, try to start shooting for score based on tune and, and tune testing stuff so that's where i'm at right now i'm still <laughs> putting in like the short sessions are going to be like maybe 45 arrows if if i have just you know maybe an hour to kill um but if i have an hour and a half to kill and there's nobody at the range you know i'll still bang out like maybe 150 arrows yeah. um, just to get the the reps in and maybe Maybe those sessions I might score a half a round to three quarters a round and then just focus on one thing to improve. Gotcha. That's that's a, that's a solid plan for sure. I know you're not a fan of of dialing back the volume of arrows that you shoot. I've watched you shoot a stupid amount of arrows while we're at a tournament the night before a tournament. But I think you also build up your strength so much that it really just doesn't have a negative effect. Um, but you yeah, know, that yeah, it's uh, my strength is just like usually come to that one event. My strength is like it's max. Sure like, yeah, like like I hear people at Lancaster be like, "Oh, I ran out of I ran out of energy. I ran out of steam." You know, yeah. and, you know those arrows wore me out. I'm like, dude, I'm like I shot like while you're shooting comp. I know you you know you might be you know at a high level like high stress level, but man, yeah, I hit that practice range and I shot four times the volume of errors you just got you guys just shot yeah. and i'm like fully ready to shoot a whole another 60 arrow round <laughs> yeah that's um and that's it that's definitely a, a way to approach it i know some people don't have the access i i would say to a range um to be able to shoot that high volume to get four or five days in 60 you know minimum 45 60 100 100 150 arrows they don't have access to that. So they have to sort of play the game and I hate to say it, but, and, and maybe dial it back that week before focus. I still think that no matter what your volume of arrows are, you still have to work on your weaknesses. You still have to like, you, you know, you talked about um, when we talk about 
your release a little bit last night or Friday night and about shooting some blind bail and trying to, you know, just refine some items of your shot. I think everybody should be doing that in some, some regard. If you, whatever is your weakness, work on the weakness period. Yeah, and, and I'll push back a little bit. Everybody has, everybody has the opportunity to work on strength and, and arrow. Yeah, yeah. 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 You could, you can blind bail, blank bail at the house. Grab a, you know, whatever, a big boy, not a, uh, you know, one of them a bag targets or something and shoot at like six yards and just, just put in some reps, like <laughs> put on a TV, watch the, watch a episode of the office or something. Yeah. And for a half hour, you can at six yards or five yards or whatever. You can bang out like a hundred arrows yeah. easy in a half hour. Yeah. Yeah, Absolutely. Then you can work on your release or whatever at the same time. Yeah. You build your strength, you know, you um, just build confidence too in general. So, yeah. all right. Well, it looks like we have our first person here, John. That's going to come in. This is, it's, it's Bruce. So we know him as Tom Tom on online. I'm going to let, let Bruce join us here. Hold on a second. Hopefully he's fully dressed. <laughs> there's some people that would join this chat and i'd be worried about that yeah <laughs> yeah but we'll see if he pulls up his camera here there he is there he is audio's connected yeah I there think I you are it. perfect all right man well welcome to the bearable project we've never done this before you happen to be the first live feed guest so what inter international guest as well yeah <laughs> so give us yeah. some give us give us the goods what's what's your question for this day yeah um well i've been shooting five years and um i tend to have a pretty steady bow arm but in the last uh, i don't know i say two and a half months i've kind of developed a bit of a when i uh hold my bow i i release and i got a little bit of a see if it seems like a movement in my wrist and uh, it's pushing my shots into the eight seven ring, but it's not consistent. But hmm. I'm not really sure what's going on, and I'm not really sure how to address it. Hmm. Um, question: Is this where is the point of your arrow when this is happening? Usually, usually focused in the yellow. So it is. Um, um, it's floating. You know. Okay. Nice float. I hopefully I feel nice, comfortable, but it's not always the case. I, I get this um get there itis. <laughs> you know, uh, I've I've heard that term on May Day that uh, show about plane crashes, and that it's kind of like that get there itis. You want to get the shot off, and uh, and and so maybe I'm pushing, I'm pushing the bow, but I'm not pushing it straight into the target. Um. When you come into the gold, which way do you come into the I gold? I come from the top. You come from top down. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I tried you... to go up to the I tried to go up from the bottom for many for a bunch of years, mm -hmm. but I found that I was there was a resistance there. Um, I'm not sure if it was like a psychological resistance, but I just couldn't seem to consistently get into the yellow and hold it there. So I started dropping down from the top, and that seemed to be the, the, the ticket special for recipe. You. Mm -hmm. are you left-handed or right-handed i'm right-handed okay john you ever heard of that so me what does it sound like to you you got any any feedback there uh you said that you're pushing to the seven eight ring which uh that's it that's it, it seems what happens side. It, left side it's, it's, left it's side to the right side, side sorry right, right side. side yeah okay could could yeah. be uh in under drawing you're short drawing just a little bit and okay and you're kind of like mini collapsing because you're yeah, not expanded talks. just enough oh, i never even thought of that yeah I, I I, what all right I, I could do a couple of videos of that uh that draw sequence and and see if there is a collapse going on because i i you, you might have seen some of the videos i've posted but um yeah i can take a look at that and see if that's an uh, if that's an issue well yeah, and it's, it, go ahead go ahead i was, I was gonna say when frank would like if if you had like an alignment shot it might be you're not like you're closed your shoulders are closed a little bit and so your shoulder it could be this when you're short drawn too your shoulders are actually pointing to the weak side 
while your arrow's looking like it's on the strong side, but when you finally shoot, everything goes neutral and it kind of like just swings in just a little bit. Actually, th that actually sounds quite plausible. So it does. Um, just thinking it through in my head that, that may be the mechanics that's going on there. Yeah. Um, it'd be nice to sort it out. <laughs> It, sound, it, I'll, 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 it sounds like to me you might have a couple of things going on I, and I think they all sort of go together like John said about having a mini collapse your your mini collapse is something that is initiated by the anticipation of getting to the middle um, mm -hmm. oftentimes not not for everyone but that's what I mm -hmm. that's the way I've seen it most often and I've experienced mm -hmm. it many times myself but I will say that if you are going trying to so you're dropping down into the middle and as you're dropping you're slowly now i'm exaggerating here but as you're dropping down you're slowly already coming through so you're not yep. staying into your back you're not staying into alignment i think that's what and that's that's sort of what john's getting at you're anticipating okay it's getting there it's getting there, it's going it's going in going in going in i want to hold and then the last second and probably because you're coming top down top down claps go left instead or go right i mean if you okay. are coming bottom up i'm willing to bet that your miss would be left okay my experience that's what i have seen i'm not saying that's concrete and i'm not saying that like that's that's absolutely true for everyone i'm saying mm -hmm. that's what i've seen um i are your misses so like your good shot misses you know when you have like you feel like it's on a scale of one to ten it's a shot that's like an eight or a better but you still miss and you don't know why where are those misses at are they right tend to be right yep okay and yeah. that's that's common so yeah you know check double check your alignment um double check your making sure that like that bow arm gets to the middle and yes you still want it to float but you don't want it to like bob float like through and around like you want it to settle no, understood understood and you know and that's that's a hard thing to do it's it's it is. you know yep. but all right. No, that's good, man. I hope I, I I'm curious to know what the response will be if you get it, get it worked out. Yeah. Um, you know, so that we can, you know, follow up on it maybe in a future. Yeah, episode. Yeah. Sounds good. All right. Thanks for the help. Yeah, no problem. Any, anything else before you head out or are you good? No, no. Just looking forward to Lancaster, seeing all you guys chatting, chatting. Oh, nice. You're coming, you're coming over. All right. I am, I am booked and uh, driving down my seven and a half hour drive. Hopefully there'll be no major snowstorms between here and Lancaster or freezing rain. Knock on wood that, that snowmageddon has happened before. <laughs> it has, it has, but I was down in 2000 and uh, I had fortunate, no snow back or forth. It's just a great drive and uh, a good time. Awesome. All right. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks for joining us, man. Good luck to you. Uh, thanks for having me. Yep, have a yep. good day guys see, see you we have a couple others that plan to come in um i do not know i sent them the link waiting for them to show up but i'm gonna i'm gonna say that either they're just falling behind or they're watching and waiting so you guys are nathan's in the in the in the shoot here um I'm trying to think who else mr uh, galegos is supposed to come in as well he had a question i'm gonna let me see if he posted his question. So, uh, um, and I don't know if I'm saying this right. Meeg Galegos is supposed to join in on the video. His question, John, was, I need a good method for distance estimation for field. I usually do the 10 meter method, but it's not so precise. I don't, I know what you taught me and what we worked with, like with Maggie. Um, I think you cover that in your JD three course, don't you for the push? Yeah. So, we, so we won't go into like explicit detail, but you know, do you want to just give a, a summarization of how, it, how it's done? And then we're going to reference them, go take your course because that explains it all. Uh, yeah. You just got to find a, a good foolproof system, find something Find something that works that you can measure, you know, what size it looks like and, you know, what distances it looks like with that particular size. Yeah. Um, it's no different than uh, a lot of the pros on the 3D side, 3D side, like, uh, you know, they'll look at this, the core of the target and, 
you know what size uh, animal it is and if their core looks really big uh, in their scope for that size animal then they know it's on the closer side and if it right. starts to look really small it's on the farther side and you can kind of i'm not saying you can get 3d down with like on the pro side you know within the yard or whatever but you can definitely narrow it down how far or close it, the target is you know with that system so it's just find something similar to that with the barebow side on the targets because the targets sizes never change you know you only have four targets to deal with four four different yeah. sizes right yeah <laughs> your your method is very good um and like i said for those who are those who are looking for that type of instruction there's a i, I think there's a plethora of tuning information in that as well go to the push pack Shout out to Matt Zernzak and the push. Um, every single one of the Bearable Project episodes, the link to John's course is there um, because there's nothing like it on the internet. Um, we're gonna we're gonna be adding a bunch more of this uh, early mid spring. Good, awesome, perfect. I love it. So there you go. That's your answer. He didn't join in, so we'll we'll. Uh, We'll run with it. We have another one here. Oh, hold on. Just going to watch but Oh, okay. Nah, no problem, Bruce. No problem. All right. Nathan Shaw had a question. He gave me kind of it's kind of a, a long one. I asked Nathan if he wanted to come on the video. I sent it to him. Uh invited him, but he hasn't shown up yet. So no worries. Um, I'm interested in the internal triggers used by high-level archers. I'm not sure if it, um, we might have to unhinge that one a little bit with Nathan can comment, but um, it's, he says it seems though a, a bit of a taboo subject um, to talk about. Sometimes my short time shooting bear boat seems like a trailer shot is much harder to repeat in high stress situations consistently. I would only imagine most top level archers are indeed using an internal trigger of some sort. Um, I am going to say Nathan that you that most high-end archers are shooting a triggerless shot. And if whoever told you that is probably not really understanding what the difference is. Um, you know what they say that, uh, what assume means? Say that again? So like you never assume. Oh. For yeah, one. It just makes an ass out of me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, yeah. Don't, don't assume anything. Um, I think. I think you're I think there's some validity to your comment that it is much harder to shoot a triggerless shot. I think it is in some ways. It's it depends just, on it's always like like you always get in an argument. Like it's not hard to do. No, you just have hard. to be you have to be honest with yourself. You have to be, you know, accepting of okay, we shoot a style of archery that's not perfect. It's never gonna be perfect. And if anybody ever tells you it's gonna be perfect they're full of crap it's yeah. just you know it we don't have a clicker you know we don't have a release aid we have our fingers we have our mind we're human it's not going to be perfect the person who shoots closest to perfect usually wins but we've never gonna we're never gonna shoot perfect we'll be on this earth for like five thousand more years or whatever nobody's nobody's ever going to shoot a 600 in in competition um at a high level competition you know I, i'd be surprised if you know we could hop in a time machine and see anybody ever shoot a 600 in a local competition i just don't think that's in the realm of possibilities yeah i agree i think i think the well one one more one more thought to go that ahead, go ahead go ahead like how many 600s were ever shot with an olympic recurve with you know, you know, 30 inch bars and 15 inch, you know, side side bars and clickers. Um, Brady shot it in Vegas once. You know, right. you just got to look at it that way. Like, we're just not perfect. That you know, if if anybody was ever to shoot perfect, it would be with Olympic recurve, and you would see it more often. It's just if you if you go with that understanding that we're just human, it's it's not going to be perfect. So. I think the problem is you can be sold on the idea that you can be perfect, maybe a, a, another way, but it's, it's not. You're, 
you have to come to the realization that not every shot's going to be perfect, but we can, like myself, uh, Grace, and everybody else, we, we understand that it's not going to be perfect. But if we can come as close as perfect as we can, you know, our scores are going to be, you know, quite good. And, you know, not giving up on a shot, not making those stupid little mistakes that even, even the little ones, like if we're on a roll, that little one's going to put it in a nine um, at the worst case, you know, best case, you know, or at the best case, it's going to put it in the nine instead of the 10. But, you know, we, we just have to shoot close to perfect as we can with the understanding that it's not going to be perfect. So we can't overstress. I think that's the biggest part of the mental game is not, um, not trying to make every shot perfect, but just trying to do the best we can. And, mm -hmm. No, um, I, I mean, I, you're, I think you hit the nail on the head. It's the, the notion of a trigger shot's better or gives you more control is a, a little bit of a fallacy in my opinion. I think it gives you, it gives you a thing that disrupts your brain and keeps you engaged in that, whatever trigger it is that you use. And that might help you a little bit, but ultimately it's not, it's not the, it's not the answer to shooting the best archery that you, that you can. Um, the one thing that holds people back from shooting a triggerless shot, I'm going to say there's a couple of things, but the number one thing is without a doubt, they focus on the wrong stuff or they're not focusing enough on the right things during the shot. Um, you know, and that comes from not shooting enough arrows, not being in a really good position, not, you know, if you have really, really, really horrible alignment, it's going to be very, very hard to shoot a trigger the shot good you know there's a few people that can get away with it but there's kind of like details to it and i'll give you an example talk to dillinger about it many many times dillinger set will tell you straight up like his lime is not perfect his anchor's forward he also shoots a lower poundage and he shoots a ton of arrows when he's training for archery everybody's gonna be like who's who's john dillinger we never heard of him yeah who is he <laughs> if you don't know Watch the uh, 2021 Lancaster Archery. Uh, yeah, classic. But anyways, you know, and he shoots a crap ton of arrows. So it doesn't matter as much for for, for Dilly. Um, you know, but like your alignment is amazing. Grayson's amazing. Um, it, it, makes, it makes that world a difference when you have it and you put yourself in a strong position. But the one thing you guys do so well is like your brain is just so engaged in that one arrow in the bow you know and that's that's one of my biggest struggles my brain goes all over the place i got a good billion things going on um and you know it's hard to like if you're if you want to be a high-end shooter focus on being a high-end shooter and don't do all the other crap um don't get involved you know don't even social media and all the other stuff like it kind of like sucks you in and your brain goes other places so um Kind of yeah, it's that, it's it's yeah, it's a the social media thing like uh, uh it's a distraction like it it you have the wrong person make their making the wrong comment at the wrong time and it can derail your your whole thought process or the idea of what you actually need to do um yeah. it can be a dangerous thing but it all also could be a blessing too it's it's kind of it's, it's 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 weird but you know, I think the uh, to go back on, on yours is like you. Most of the people that have issues shooting a triggerless shot is they overemphasize on the aim. They get too engorged by the you know precise aim, and that's where we all run into problems. It's like driving a car when you're try when you're driving down the highway, you're not focused on like covering that line. Like I got to be like a foot off of that line. That way I know I'm a foot and a half off this line. And you're not like, oh, super hyper-focused on that line. You're just like, boom, staring straight ahead. Um, and, and that's how we drive. That's how we should be shooting. We should be like, okay, get in the lane, all right, which would be your aim, and then just like focus right through it. And that's that's how our aim should be. Um, and that's where most of the people make that mistake. They just sit there and just hyper-focus on that aim. And that's what gets them a little little giddy on their shots where they yeah. start flinching a little yeah. bit. And, yeah, we exactly. and we said that for for I mean years. Don't enjoy the aim. Don't but don't like get it there. Let it happen. But don't 
you're never going to hold it perfectly still. You can get real close. You get close on good aiming days. You know, you float 10 to 10, 9 to 9, you know. I don't. I never, ever float that small. It's one of the things that I've been working. That's one of the things I work on. That's I want to I want to be able to do that. But you have to Grayson talks about this. You have to you have to have something that you're still focusing on past the aim. Whether it's a hold, whether it's a mantra, whether it's, a, you know, a, a feeling, a position. I mean, everybody's got their own ways to to break that down. There's no one perfect or right way you make it work, you make it work, but you've got to, you've got to continue to focus past that aim until you, your body's ready or you're mentally ready. Like, okay, I can move on with the shot. You know, it's going to happen now. Um, and then finish it the way that you trained. Yeah. And it's kind of, it's kind of weird. Like I consider myself a puncher. Like yeah, if I'm yeah. shooting a compound, I'm punching it. Um, if I'm shooting the recurve, I'm punching it. But the difference is if I'm hyper-focused on that bullseye, and I punch it, I get real flinchy. My yeah. release goes kind of goes to crap. Like one of them might be like perfect. The next one's going to be like out here. The next one's going to be like, meh, you yeah. know. Um, but if I focus through it and punch it, it's much cleaner. I could be way more precise with this in the back if I'm not hyper focused on the, the target. Because when, you, when you're hyper focused on that center, like everything tenses up a little bit. And when, when things tense up, you're going to be your body's going to be doing things that it's not supposed to be doing it's going to get tense like maybe your bow arm tenses up and so when that tenses up it's going to affect this um you know it just the tension is no good um and i think a lot of people run into problems when they're hyper focused on the center as they start tensing up in little areas and not only is it not good for that little area but that little area is going to affect like say it's my my bow arm my grip my grip tenses up now it's going to tense up my arm it's going to tense up my shoulder. And then now this is super tense. Now this is gets, now this gets like kind of funky because this is super tense, but in my practice sessions, the ones that hit the dead, nut 11 or, 10 or X, however you're scoring it are the ones that are like, you shoot it and you're like, Whoa, I didn't yeah. feel anything like yeah. nothing. Like it just felt like so effortless. It just like, yeah. like nothing. Like, it's like, wow. Like yeah. that's what it needs to feel like every move. time. You know, the bow arm doesn't move. That bow yeah. just like floats out of your hand. You just yeah. finish and you're just like, oh, that felt so good. And you're like, yeah, it was so easy. Why yeah. can't I do it again? Yeah. And then and then what happens is we move on to the next arrow. And you know, maybe you do, maybe you shoot the next arrow good. And then you have two in the middle. And then that third one, you're like, oh, I really want to put this one in the middle. I want that. Yeah. Arrow. And then your attitude changes because you yep. just changed your aiming mechanism. You just you just changed everything. Like so then you do, you get tensed up and you're like, oh, let's, let's throw this third one in there. And then you just like, you hyper-focus on hit, maybe slapping your arrows or whatever. Yeah. And then you get tense and then you're like, oh, crap. Yeah. We, <laughs> we, we both did it on Friday. I mean, we, we, we both had like, you know, well, you did it twice in a row. Yeah. I had, My, I had mine. Mine wasn't an aiming issue. Mine was, uh, let's watch the arrow fly because I want to check. But your tune. brain focused on something else. Yeah. Your brain wrong... focused on where it needed to be. Yep. It focused on the wrong thing. Yep. Why? And, but it's funny though, because during that round, you know, I was playing with my tune. Uh, we were watching arrow flight. We we're messing with what, you know, my knock height. It's like, hey, can you watch? And, and you said to me, it's funny because, then you turn around and did it to yourself. You're like, you're, we're shooting next to each other. We're standing in, in the lane and we're during the tournament. Yes. We're, I mean, it's just a local shoot, but we're messing with tunes and screwing around. And he's like, just, he, you, and you go to me, just shoot a good shot. You have to shoot a good shot. Or you're not going to know. You're not going to know if that arrow flight's good. You're not going to know if that moving that knock set is going to make a difference, you know, but then you turn around you're like, I want to see this arrow flight. And then you go. Pow. <laughs> <laughs> literally it's it was pow it hit the metal and bounced halfway back the range i mean it was a halfway but... well that that one was i'm gonna draw hold this thing <laughs> and oh, as, that's I right. was, as i was letting down the figures just came off the string i'm like what the frick are you doing and you verbalized that before you drew it back i think i'm gonna I did. Do a draw hold on this one and you're because there we just got we just got done taking like a 20 minute break and so like we're all like you know not stretched out or anything yeah. And I was like, oh, I'll stretch out on doing a draw hold. And I pulled an Elton Wong, shot it on a draw hold. <laughs> <laughs> so, 
smacked. And then the next end, it wasn't any better, but it was it was comical nonetheless and a good time. But it's it's it goes to show though, as soon as you let your brain go outside of what you're supposed to be thinking on, yeah, everything goes to hell in a handbasket. So um got a couple other questions here uh in the chat. So we're gonna run with those real quick. Um, Chris, Chris, or no, Tom Lyle says, why is a super deep crawl bad? Um, Tom, I'm, I, I think you need to define what you consider super deep. Um, but in the no. meantime, let's, we can, we can, let's break that down about you. You can give your version of what you shoot and I'll give my experience with shooting and coaching but where's your crawl and why do you shoot it you do shoot a deeper crawl it's not super deep in my opinion but it's deep enough yeah it's average i would say well i i did move my anchor up for indoors okay uh, outdoors i'm usually here mm -hmm. all right lower i2 yep and indoors i went from here upper right to here yeah so i changed my crawl by a, a finger width literally a finger width. Um, I like to shoot closer to the knock if I can, but there's going to be some compromises. I'm not going to shoot this anchor against the knock because I know I'm going to be shooting like a super long, super heavy arrow at around 120 feet a second. I'm not going to do that because that just opens up the doors for inconsistency. Uh, like just crazy scores. If I, you know, happen to short draw a quarter inch or collapse a little, it's just going to magnify downrange. Um, so I don't, personally, I don't want a really long crawl either. And I would say like, if you're shooting a Yoast tab, I would not be comfortable shooting for me, the bottom of the tab for uh, a 20 yard score. Um, if I was shooting field and I had to crawl down there, fine. You know, it's just a couple targets here and there. Um, but I don't want, I don't want to have to crawl that far. Now it's not saying you can't shoot great scores that way if you're consistent on your form, but the way I look at it is the closer I can get my anchor up and the arrow closer to my eye as possible, that, that angle gets smaller. So any, any inconsistency doing this mm -hmm. is going to be smaller downrange. Mm -hmm. But if I got a big crawl and I do this. All right, now my angle changed a lot more from the arrow or from my fingers to the arrow. Um, doing this is going gonna, is gonna to change a lot. Um, yeah. It's going to move the arrow up and down that target, you know, a little bit more. Not like, you know, we're talking maybe a ring or two, um, but if I can eliminate some of that, I'm going to. Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll piggyback off of, of the notion for me and why I'm not a huge fan of a deep crawl for indoors specifically field. You don't have a choice. You're going to have to have a deep crawl for certain yardages. And that is fine. Um, you're not shooting high volume arrows at that. One thing is I smoke my nose, the deeper I go on my crawl um, because of the head position that I shoot in. And I refuse to change my head position and try to repeat moving my head in a way that I'm not hitting my nose. Um, a deeper hook plays a role in that for me with the nose also. I like a deep hook, keeps that string away from my nose, um, and it gives me a more solid anchor point. Um, also with the deep crawl, I feel from my experience working with shooters um, and, and as a shooter myself, that a deeper crawl puts more pressure on that bottom finger and it leads to inconsistencies with the release. Um, for high volumes of arrows, I like to be as close to the center of that string as possible. Obviously, we're not shooting split finger. So you're underneath. You know, I also think that that being closer, the, the closer to the knock that you can be, the better off you are. Um it does have it's counter and productive to what John said about the knock, getting that knock as close to the eye though. So that's where you can, you can, if you have a shallow crawl, but you come up to that upper eye tooth, it brings that arrow up closer. So there's like a happy medium there. Um, but it's, you know, 
it's six of one, half dozen the other. You shoot how you want. If you make it work, great. It is what it is. You know, don't be afraid to try it and play around with the different, you know, different crawls, different arrow lengths, diff- different arrow weights, because all that stuff's going to have an effect on how, how and where your crawl is. You're shooting a super short, super light arrow. Your crawl is going to be big. If you have a longer, heavier arrow or even not a super long arrow, like your 30 and a half, 31 inch Easton six, six, five match grade arrows. They're like a two, three, four diameter, I think, or something like that. I'm not sure. Yeah. Two, two, four, four, two, four, four. So that arrow is not super long, but it's heavy. And he's, you know, so your crawl's not crazy big. Um, I think when I shot it, I, I shot your arrows. I think my crawl is like half the US tab. Like that's acceptable. Like I'm 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 happy with that crawl. I don't want to be much lower than that if I don't have to be. Um, but so I hope that answers your question, Tom. Um it's not bad. It 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 could be. Um uh, for me it is. I'm not a fan of it. And and I think that also plays a role too. Like you have to do something and try it. And if you like it, run with it. If you don't like it and you're not getting good results, don't do it because somebody else is doing it. You do what works for you, um, bottom line. So that's a good uh, good topic, though, for sure. Chris Nixon has a question. Um, I got a question about how, if at all, you guys handle change of a bow tune or arrow spine reaction associated with the crawl being further down the string when shooting shorter distances, such as 20 yards. I think – so that's really a field. Yeah, I don't know if he's – I, I don't know if you specified to people or not if this is going to be indoor or if this is just no. Like a I did it. No, that's okay. okay. I mean, we can we well <clears throat> we can talk about it because it's even if they say and it, it kind of it's it's sort of relatable to the previous question. Um, you know what's the you change tunes like crazy? You change arrows and stuff like that. I'll change know. it during a shoot. Yeah, I know. I've witnessed it. <laughs> I, well. <laughs> In the beginning, I was like dead set. There is no way I'm making, I wouldn't even move my plunger in the beginning. (laughs) Now I just don't give a shit, but it's, it's, but I think confidence in understanding the reaction to your equipment, the reaction to the changes, you understand your body, the way the mechanics of your shot and your equipment better than anyone. So you are definitely more comfortable kind of making those changes on the fly than most people would be. Um, I, you know, I think that's, that's a, that, I think that's part of the whole like handling change, Chris. Um, You need to do it, dare I say, in practice and understand what the change is going to be and how that, what that reaction is going to be. And you have to also accept that sometimes that reaction that you expect it to, to happen isn't what happens. It's completely the opposite and it messes with you. You have to be okay with that too and realize, eh, I made that decision. But yeah, I uh, uh kind of I was gonna answer kind of give my answer on that one would be like if if how would you adjust? Well, you would just tune it. Um if you're shooting shorter distances, like say on 3D, um you could either just gap shoot. Um, I've done that. That's how I usually shoot 3D. Um, or you can just change your tune and tune it for the mid distance. If you're shooting for indoors, then yeah, I just move my plunger or just play with poundage until, until I'm comfortable. But so I'll, I'll work off of that for indoors. Like it's kind of weird for indoors. It depends on where you train, uh, lighting impacts, uh, arrow impact, uh, it could be great. Like, it's like shooting. I don't know if anybody's ever familiar shooting outdoors. Um, you shoot in the beginning, you know, in the, in the morning, your arrows are going to hit a certain place in the target. You shoot midday. If you do nothing but shoot your bow midday, okay, you're going to be down the middle midday. But if you are shooting in the morning for like the first time ever, but your bow set up for midday, you're going to find your arrows are going to impact, um, depending on where, how your range is set up, it could impact you know, left of the gold and you're, you'd be like, Oh, what, what's wrong with me? That, you know, you know, I should be down the middle, but then if you shoot for the next like three hours and now you're in midday, those arrows boom, move right in the middle. But if you shoot in the afternoon, boom, they're going to impact to the other side. Um, same thing with indoors. Like we're dealing not with the sun moving, 
in the horizon, but now we're dealing with lighting. If we have a, a dominant light right here and we're looking mm -hmm. at our arrow, right? We're looking at our arrow. You can see right here. Yeah, I you have can a, see it. I, yeah. have, I have a strong light right here. Yep. So you can see this glare. Mm -hmm. And what our eyes naturally do, like they kind of look at the glare. And so that glare is not like we're trying to aim at the middle, but now we're actually looking at our glare and we're moving our arrow over a little bit to align with that glare um, subconsciously. We're not doing it on purpose. It's just that's what our eyes tend to do. And so now our impact is going to be on the left side or the right side, depending on where that dominant light's coming from. If it's coming from here, or if it's coming from here. And if you shoot, you know, at your range and you always get right directly under the light, you're going to be down the middle. But now if that light's coming here, you're going to be left or right of the center. And you think you're doing something wrong, but you're not. It's just your, your eyes are just naturally trying to put that air in the middle, but we're actually looking at the glare and not the center, you know, the center of it. Yeah. Um, that's something to, to really be conscious about when you're shooting indoors. Um, I've had one range where the, the, it was a low ceiling, like maybe 10 foot ceilings. Um, and we had like, there's only three lights in like a 14 lane room. Mm -hmm. Um, and they were super ass bright. I mean, like they're super bright. Like I, I went, I practiced, you know, you know, we, you, if you showed up early, you could practice and I shot and I went under the light and shot and like down the middle. Okay. Um, they said a lane, lane assignments. I'm like on the left side, uh, of this light. And I'm like, okay, cool. You know, first arrow, six ring left literally six ring like whoa okay so i spent the next five arrows clicking that thing over and doing everything i can to get that thing centered back up yeah and i shot the afternoon line and i went to the other side of the light <laughs> now i'm on the other side <laughs> since i moved it from six ring down to the middle now i'm like in the three four ring oh um, that, that was when i was shooting really fat arrows too so yeah. that glare went way over on the fat. Well, yeah, arrow. that's the fatter the arrow, the wider that 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 glare has to move. That's one, another benefit of shooting a smaller diameter arrow. It's not going to have as much of an effect. Yeah. So that's something you guys got to be conscious of. Um, yeah. It kind of falls in the line of what what would you do if your arrows impact on tune? But yeah, it does. I mean, I also think, and there's a there's a form thing that goes into that that notion. Um, if you're somebody that moves your head significantly coming into anchor, and if you aren't moving your head the exact same way every time, that's why, like, when I work with somebody, I try to get rid of that excessive movement. You know, I think you can have a you can have a little bit, and whatever it is that you do, it has to be repeatable. But if you're somebody that, like, and I'll give you an example, a low anchor, and you have to move your head around to try to get to a string blur, you're all if you don't do it exactly the same way every time you're going left right left right left right you have a fatter arrow and if you're moving your head left and right you're going to see that that bright spot on your arrow it's going to move you're not going to visually see it move but it's it has to move because your angle of the way you're looking at that arrow it's going to change it but again we're talking if you're shooting perfect arrows you're going to see it i think a lot of people they do these things that actually promote inconsistency and they're again they're worried about tune or they're worried about all of this other stuff and they're not even able to stay you know with the majority of their arrows in a decent enough group to even see that difference um and I, you know and we've this is a little off topic but we've talked about that many times worry about the, the the important things first don't stress over the tune as much you can shoot a decent score with a not so greatly tuned bow um but you you know worry about the right things and work on the right things don't stress out about all the other nonsense um let me see we got a couple others here let me see let me see let me see um robbie weisinger wants to know what my hair care routine is robbie it's min wax. Yeah. Nair. Yeah. I near my, I near my bald head. Um, shave it, baby. Straight razor. There's no other way. There's no other way. Um, Greg Rothenberger says low poundage, better or worse. What do you think? 
yeah, it's it's neither here nor there. I think it's yeah, it's there's there's trade offs. You got to yeah. figure out what works for you. Like trade off is, you know, arrows a little bit slower. Um, so inconsistencies can magnify, but the positive could be is if you can shoot all your arrows controlled that way, then do it. Um, yeah. I shot some pretty good scores coming off an of injury shooting 30 pounds before. Um, but when my fingers got a little stiff, uh, 30 pounds sucked for me. <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. Try it sometimes. Shoot, shoot, uh, you know, if, when you're not tuned and getting ready for tournaments, take three turns off of your bow and feel, feel the difference in your release when you have a low poundage versus like 40, 42 and it zips through like nothing. Um, but you have to be comfortable holding that weight and yeah. realize like you crank that weight up. It does, ex uh, it it uh, exasperates the target panic a little bit. So yeah, and 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 the more poundage you shoot, the more demanding your training regimen has to be. Um, I can maintain at thirty pounds by basically never shooting an arrow, mm -hmm. but I cannot do the same at thirty six pounds. I have to start shooting arrows. And then once I shoot outdoor weight, like a 42-ish to 43, I got to shoot a lot more arrows. And back in the day when I shot like 47 uh, for bare bow, I had to shoot every day and I had to do strength training like every other day. Yeah. Yeah. What so there's a, there's a time involvement, a time investment with that as well. Yeah. And I, 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 don't, I and John, I don't think people look at it that way. They just, they hear, oh, so-and-so shoots 40 pounds, 38 pounds. I want to shoot that. And then they're shooting two days a week and they're wondering why their target panic so bad and they can't get to the middle and the things. And, and if they're shooting, you know, at the end of their hook and they're like right here and here and here, and they're wondering why they can't, um, they can't get to the middle that, you, you know, you're getting out on those nerve endings on the finger good luck well, you're just making it worse well there's no strength on the tips of your fingers either no. there's no holding strength none whatsoever you're just all you're sitting on is nerves there when, when you pick up a, a pail of whatever rocks or water you mm -hmm. don't grab that pail and carry it on your fingertips no no that's a great that's a great example so all right man i hope that answers your question so we got another one mike I'm going to butcher this, Huri, H-A-U-R-I. I'm not sure if I said that correctly. He said, what's the best way to get back into shooting after a couple of years break? <laughs> yeah, you've never taken a couple of years off. I have. Um, shoot a lot. <laughs> Go shoot. <laughs> just shoot. Do, do, do the whole polar bear club thing, man. Just jump right in. <laughs> jump right in. 100%. <laughs> well, I, I don't, Mike, I don't know what you're looking for specifically. If you were a competitive shooter, if you were just a recreational shooter, dude, just go shoot and shoot a lot. And then when you start getting some relative consistency, you know, maybe look for some coaching. I don't know where you're at. There's more and more bear, like bare bow related coaches popping up across the country that really have an idea. They're doing their homework. Um, and when I say bare bow, I'm not talking. I'm talking about coaches who either shot Barebo or currently actively coach like good Barebo shooters. There's not a ton out there, but we can definitely point you in the right direction. Or you do some online stuff. That's an option. I'm not a big fan of the online. I only do it for when people specifically reach out and ask because I know that they're committed. Um, but like it's it's not the best way. In person is the best way. Absolutely no question. In-person coaching is the best way. So, um, Jared Mola. Okay. <laughs> Jared Mola says, uh, can you guys do one of these every day till the 25th? <laughs> can I, should I block him from the live feed now? <laughs> no, he, he, not yet. Just Frank. Not Frank. Uh, Santo. Sorry. <laughs> oh yeah. No, just, <laughs> um, he tried to get on. I don't know what his dealio is. Maybe he just I don't know. Know. I, he he didn't show up to work participants. In. I sent him the link. So he's just he's 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 a crabby he's a uh curmundron right now. Yeah. <laughs> he ate crabby patties today. 
Bree Cosgrove. Um, Bree's a new shooter, but she's she's doing pretty well. She's working hard. But she said, should I check my string blur every shot? Do you check your string blur every shot? I, I don't think you do. Uh, I, I, I do, but I don't. It's it's almost all like subconscious. Like if I can okay. see my string blur, I know it's out of out of alignment. I put my string blur right down the center of the riser. So if, if my string, if I see any of it, I know yeah. it's wrong. I usually don't see it that, that way. It's like right on the riser. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sort of the same. I, I will, after I, um, after the aim starts, I will come back to the string blur a little bit, or sometimes, sometimes I miss, I won't check my string blur. And if I, I know my tendencies. So if, if I, if I don't finish the blur and put it in the right spot, I'll start shading one way or the other. And I'll see like, I'll, I'll, I'll hit left side, nine, left side, nine, eight, left side, nine, eight in that area, because I'm not finishing the blur. I'm not putting it in the right position. I will tell you that you can still tune a bow and it's not optimal for everyone. It worked pretty well for me. My first like two years, if you just try not to move your head at all, string blur is where it is, at least for a new shooter. String blur is where it is, and you just focus on, I'm not moving my head. I'm going to get to anchor. I'm going to finish a strong shot, and you go through that. But, you know, there's – you. I'll, I will also say that was indoor archery. Outdoor target archery, you absolutely positively need to know or be cognitive of the string blur. John and Grayson beat it into my brain because I was like, I ain't worrying about it. I ain't worried about it. And then you go 50 meters and you watch groups like this float from the seven ring to seven ring. You'll never know where they end up. You can't get away with that at 50 meters. Chalk one up. I, yeah, I, behind I mean, the scenes, behind the scenes, you don't know how bad, how brutal Grace and I were on you, on Frank. <laughs> yeah, you guys have no idea. No the idea. verbiage that was used. <laughs> The nicknames added to the I'm group. glad that we've gotten past that part of our life. <laughs> Let me just say that. Some, a little bit, not as much. We still bust on each other a lot. Um, Chris. Yeah, Jared, I don't know why you're shooting 47 pounds. That's That sucks. Um, Nathan said, can you dive a little bit deeper into different internal triggers? That, no, I can't, Nathan. I'm not going to lie. No internal triggers for me. Don't teach them. Don't know anything about them. I don't even think it's, I don't even think it's worth pursuing. Frank's a closet murper. Don't let him fool you. <laughs> Knew that was coming. No, I'm sorry, Nathan. I can't. I, I, I'm, you know, I, you know, who's good yeah. at the internal uh, triggers? Joel Christian Turner. Wilder. Um, he Joel. uses, he uses one. It's kind of, you find them on Adam and Eve and stuff. He, that's his uh, internal yeah. trigger. Yeah. <laughs> good old, good old boy, Christian Wilder. Yeah, Christian's watching this nonsense. That's how he shoots all his all his buck. <laughs> um, that is how he shot. He he, <laughs> he murped he murped his buck. Um, yeah, he absolutely uh, did. He did. Yeah, <laughs> he, he murped it. Sorry, Nathan, can't help you there, buddy. I, I'm I'm not gonna lie. Like, if you were local to me and you came to me and wanted an eternal trigger, I'd say no. I'm not. I I'm not teaching it. I'm not teaching it. I don't know about it. Uh, I'm not gonna lie. Uh, I think that there's other things that are worth pursuing than that to shoot a, a good, solid, repeatable shot. So that's my honest opinion. Um, Matt Yaka said to me, or he's this isn't a question. This is just a comment. Um, string blur is more important than aim for Matt. I'm curious, Matt, where you put your string when you're checking your string blur, finalizing it's, your string blur. It's more important than what? Uh, than his aim. I know I, I I can I can feel a smart ass comment coming, but I'm I'm a, I'll, I'll sit back and wait. Um. Yeah, I I'm curious where Matt, where and when Matt checks his string blur. I'm 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 guessing with it being. Uh, such an integral part of shots after he aims but you know after he sort of like initiates the aim and then holds and then maybe checks that shingler one more time before he lets it lets it rip it's different for everyone yeah We've said it a million times you everybody's got a process and you're finding which one works best for you and then work on that individual you know 
be able to work on it in totality. And then when you have issues, work on the things that you're struggling with. Aim half to natural, sting blur doesn't. Uh, sure. Yeah, I, I think for some people, I think it changes. I think it can change. I think it can change mid-tournament, to be honest with you, Matt. But um, I think that's it. Right. Yeah, Chris said that he w wished Matt would have come on. Matt, Matt can. Matt has an open invite. So does Robbie. Who's, who's Chris, and why does he want Matt on? <laughs> he paid block him. Some, block yeah. them both. What we don't see, yeah. What we don't <laughs> see is that he paid him Venmo. He Venmoed him a couple bucks. Hey, go in there and say this. He Venmoed him the shirtless photos. <laughs> <laughs> well. He, we we he, we miss we miss the summertime shirtless photos, Matt. Summer summertime shirtless photos with Matt Yaka are fun. <laughs> yeah, Robbie, I messaged you for for that reason, but that's all right, buddy. We'll get you on. We'll probably do this again. We'll do this again for sure. That's about but, it. I, I think, think that's that again. was Robbie's that was Robbie's only opportunity to get on here. Um, sorry you failed at life. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, it's getting deep now. It's getting deep now. Anybody, it's no one is safe in the chat. No one is safe uh, in the chat. Hey, if we tease you, we like you. It's true story. <laughs> true story. Lame. You're not. He said you're lame. <laughs> well, congratulations anyways, Robbie. You, you shot uh, a hell of a tournament at the Iowa Pro. And congratulations to your better half as well. Yeah. yeah. Double gold, baby. Yep. Mm-hmm. Looked like good stuff. Jesse Rhodes said, I'm just here for the comments, and they did not disappoint. They never do. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is what's coming up in the future. Um, before we kind of close this thing out, um, we have – I'm doing the seminar in Arizona at uh, Anchor Point Archery with Pam Van Wy. Her son made Team USA this year. Andrew, good kid. Um, doing this, the advanced seminar out there, I'm doing an online seminar in April. Um, that's another, you know, it's eight hours, two days of four hours a piece. Um, can I get on super fast? Yes, Matt, you can. I'll let you hop on quick and we'll, we'll send that over to you and we'll. So anybody that's, that's, if anybody's that wants to like tune out now because the content's just going extremely downhill it's, now's it's the gonna time. go to yep it's gonna go to shit real fast um we got the i got the advanced seminar coming up in arizona in march uh it's uh right around um st patrick's day um the online one in april um all of the i mean every registration is open right now lancaster numbers are way up lancaster you have nf um lost you got vegas what week after that um indoor nationals i think is probably closed at this point here in america i don't know about other countries um that have their national tournaments and when um and oh we still we still uh oh you might want to like preview matt's video um before we actually like you can record it he's already on his way in and i have probably sure on the remove from video button all ready oh, to go just in um, case Next next case. next week we're doing a podcast with Matt in the push about like Lancaster and stuff. Okay. Oh, look at freaking like the sixty year old bear right there. <laughs> I'm sixty and I look better than you at what? <laughs> oh, dude, I don't know, man. Put glasses on, dude. <laughs> Where do you see him? Where do you see him in person, Matty? You'll be impressed. Uh -oh. You want to take shirts off right now? See who looks better. Hey, I, I got the, uh, the the winter carpet on, so I cannot. <laughs> God dang. No, so I wanted to explain what I was talking about string blur real quick. Okay, go ahead. So I think string blur is crazy important. Like I think I, I um, somewhere at the very end of my Olympic recurve endeavor, um, I realized it and I was like, wow, like that really made a huge difference because I wasn't paying attention to it. This is before Barebo anything. Mm -hmm. And then when I came into Barebo, um, I couldn't do it because of the way the length of the arrows and the way we aim at the arrow, aim with the arrow versus mm -hmm. a, a pin. 
Mm -hmm. um, I couldn't do it. Uh, I had a hard time finding what the string blur should be. And what I ended up doing, I, I've told some people this, is I actually look over the string. So if you ever watch me shoot, I, I look over the inside of the string. I don't keep my arrow on the outside. I aim from the inside. So the way I see it is string arrow riser. Like John said, as, as most people do, they put the string on the riser. Julie does that. A lot of people I coach, that's how I do it. I have them put it on the riser the way I do it, though. And I know Stonebreaker does as well. We look over the string, he and I do. So the way this, I see it is... I this see is like, a Stonebreaker free zone, bro. <laughs> yeah. Nah. Anyway, sorry. anyway but, but we, I've spoken to him about it, but because um, I thought I was the only one that did it. And apparently he does that as well. But the way I see it is I see string blur, arrow, riser. And then what I do is I get my arrow as close to the string as I can on the inside, not on the outside of the string, right? So a right-handed shooter, you would see arrow, string, riser, or like John said, and most people do, arrow, riser, string in the same plane. I go inside and I see... So the reason I say the aim is not as important as the string blur is because aim, like I stated in that text, becomes pretty natural. We know how to point the arrow at the yellow. Yeah. So I don't really focus so much on putting my, at the end of my arrow, not the point, but the end of my arrow on the yellow. I do that and then I really focus on the string blur. If I don't pay attention to string blur at 50 meters, my arrows are out in outer space somewhere. Yeah. Um, indoor, I do pay attention to it, but I'm shooting a fat shaft right now. And it just seems to just sit right in there. There's not much of an extra smart as I see it. Fatty Maddie. That's funny. <laughs> anyway, Julie, um, but anyway, <laughs> but Julie put in that name for you. <laughs> Definitely been not. Way. It's been that way a long time. Uh, anyway, so that was my point. Like, I don't really waste too much time focusing on the aim as much as I do as the stringler. That was when, it. so my question was, and I don't know if you heard it. When, when are you setting your string blur? Like when's the last time you're looking at it throughout the process of aiming? Um, so I'll, uh, I'll draw, pick it up. I'll get the aim and then I'll kind of situate into the string blur. Then it's over. And that's sorry. And that's what I call my front end of the shot. And then I let the front end of the shot be its own thing. It's done. And then I focus on the back end of the shot. So I, yeah. after that, I just think about the rest. Yeah. Um, the and is your is... anchor f a little bit more forward now than it used to be? Mm -mm. My anchor's never changed. So where? show me your actual anchor right now. Soft on my lip right there. Okay. So it, it, it's not back here corner or up here eye tooth. It's actually probably forward. Oh, it is forward a little bit. Rick Stonebreaker's anchor is forward a little bit. If you look at him from a profile, you can see it's actually forward a little bit. That gotcha. enables you to see it that way. I'm not, I'd have to try it or like play around with it to have a, an honest opinion on, on the, on doing that. I will preface what you said about this. It works for you. It works for Rick. I'm not going to tell a new shooter to go do that. I don't, I never do either. So anyone who's listening to this, yeah. please understand this is, we're not advocating for somebody who's been shooting for six months or Oh, I'm gonna put the string blur on the left side of the arrow, and I'm a right hand. Well, I'm not, I'm not, let's I, keep it simple at, initially. That's that's just the way you're leaning into Correct. into into the string. Yeah, um, and that's and that string blur is gonna dictate uh, where it's at is gonna dictate what you naturally do. Um, right. You know, if if you're, I know a lot of people that are left eye dominant and they shoot right handed. I know a lot of those guys. They'll sit there and they'll like, they'll actually look across it, and so it looks all funky. But you could still you could still use that string blur the same way. Yeah. Um, you're going to be more on like Maddie's side. It's going to be on the other side. Um, so on Thursday, that's funny you should mention that. On Thursday, someone was watching me shoot and then asked me if I was left eye dominant. Yeah. Uh, like yeah. left eye dominant. I was like, no. And I was like, well, you your head's over the string. The other side is like, and I had to explain exactly what I just did. I look over the string. For my string blur to be on the my my arrow to be on the inside of the string not the outside yeah a lot of people ask that's a common question too like oh where's your string blur where's your string blur 
you know, an, an, an Olympic recurve, they, you will see it throughout anything you look for NTS. And I think, you know, I can agree. I can get on board with it from, from the site housing to, to the riser somewhere in that general area. It, for me personally, the way I anchor, the way that my positioning is, it is very difficult for me to bring the string all the way over to the riser. I am end of plunger, mid plunger. That's where I'm at. That's well, I shoot similar to Maddie. Well, I shouldn't say Maddie shoots similar to me, but no. Um, I, I, lean, I lean a little bit too, mm -hmm. but I lean and the, and the string blur comes through the riser. If I right. leaned a little bit more, I'd be on Maddie's side where I'd be on the other side of the arrow. So I see it on the edge of the riser because I, when I come back, you'll see, like, I'll, I'll come back and then I'll go. Yep. Mm -hmm. Put right in there. Yeah. Again, it's, it's six, one half dozen, the other, if you make it work and it works, then run with it. Yeah. I'm a proponent of doing, if it feels good to you, Yeah, you're going to, you're going to shoot whatever you whatever feels good to you better than whatever feels unnatural. 100% agree. Now trying to do it with the, the other way to me feels completely unnatural. I can't even, it's so, it's so weird to sit with my head straight and keep that string on the riser. It's weird. I tried it the other day. I, I think, like, I think there's, I think there's pros and cons to it, Matt. And that's only because from a repeatability standpoint, you're going to keep your head still more repeatable than you are moving it every single time. Right. Right. But that's not necessarily true because like john now a volume of arrows and and experience changes that so yeah. if you know you are a shooter that maybe only shoots once or twice a week maybe it is best that you shoot that way if you're a shooter that's going to get that four or five six days of practice in and you're really trying to finite that aim and get that string blur where you need it you're practicing all of that extra stuff so that it's going to come more natural to you. John's been doing it for a, over a decade of shooting right. barebow. So it's going to work for him in that manner for sure. Um, you just can't, you can't, you, experience is priceless in that, in that regard. So, but yeah, no, that's good. It's a good topic, man. It's a good conversation. I'm glad you're able to come on and, and chat about it. It's good to see yeah, you too. It's been a while. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Yeah, my day, week, is bud. my day is officially complete now. <laughs> How come right before you came on, you were like, the, I gotta go. The the wife is gonna have a, an epic night. <laughs> <laughs> we're still PG 13. Yeah, Let's keep it. Listen, before know, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna Netflix and chill. Netflix and chill. I'm gonna message Tara right now. Yeah, I was gonna say and apologize in advance. Oh man. I know. This went downhill fast. Leave it up to John. Tell your oh, tell your your other half we said hello. And uh I think that's it. Hello. We're gonna shut her down. What? Not that I was talking to her. <laughs> there. The, the the better half in the relationship. Yeah. Really, we, we miss yeah. you. Not not they, this guy. They said they miss you. Yeah, you <laughs> forget it. <laughs> anyway, all right, man. You have a good night. John, the has been. Thanks for joining me. I'll see you on Friday at Lonesome Road if we're able to shoot. All right. Okay. All Sounds right, good. everyone. Hey, come shoot with us. You want to take a road trip? Come to Lonesome Road Archery. John and I are going to shoot this week, probably Friday. All right. Deuce, Peace out, everyone. Deuces. Barrel Project out. Hey.